Thank you so much for joining us for CBN News Watch. I'm Ephraim Graham. Ahead today, increasing tensions between the U.S. and China. The U.S. military releasing new video of a closer look at the Chinese ship that cut across the path of a U.S. destroyer in the Taiwan Strait over the weekend, forcing the American ship to slow down to avoid a collision. We need to stand strong, and sorry, this administration needs to stand strong against this type of, uh, of coercion. Another danger from the border crisis, black market cannabis, tainted with toxins with dangerous pesticides on it. And the cartels involved are also dealing in other deadly operations. If they're growing black market cannabis that's tainted with these toxics, they're also trafficking, you know, dirty fentanyl pills that are killing hundreds of thousands of Americans. How should Republican presidential candidates handle the abortion issue? Some say they're putting their heads in the sand like an ostrich. They never go on offense on this issue. They tend to hide from it. But others explain how the GOP can make this a winning issue. And a landmark from biblical times, the Tower of David, being restored with modern technology. So now visitors can not only see the renovated museum, but touch it as well. We wanted to engage the visitors, especially the young generation, with the story by adding technology, interactive media, and of course, the real objects that came back home to the Citadel. Those stories and more today on CBN Newswatch. This is CBN Newswatch. We begin this half hour with the incident at sea between China and the United States. The American Navy releasing a video of a Chinese warship crossing in front of a U.S. destroyer in the Taiwan Strait. It is only the latest in a series of aggressive and risky moves by China that have U.S. officials concerned. Dale Hurd has the story. New video today shows just how close a Chinese warship came to a U.S. Navy destroyer in the Taiwan Strait Saturday, some 150 yards, nearly causing a collision. Just last week, a Chinese fighter jet flew within 400 feet of an American spy plane over the South China Sea, causing the U.S. plane to bounce wildly in the fighter jet's wake. U.S. officials called the maneuver unnecessarily aggressive and part of a pattern by China. Retired Rear Admiral Mark Montgomery told CBN's Faith Nation China's actions are ramping up tensions. This is the second very, very close intercept in the last six months of one of these types of aircraft. So really unprofessional actions uh, by the Chinese. China fashions itself a, a great power and then operates petulantly like this. It really creates a crisis. The risky engagements come as the relationship between the two countries has begun to fray with disagreements over everything from trade to Taiwan to Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin in Singapore warned the Chinese government to rein in its conduct and offered them a choice. To be clear, we do not seek conflict or confrontation, but we will not flinch in the face of bullying or coercion. China's defense minister told the U.S. to, quote, mind your own business, and called the American and Canadian military presence in the Taiwan Strait a provocation. The chairman of the House Intelligence Committee says the U.S. must stand strong against an increasingly aggressive China. This is unacceptable. And what we're seeing is an unbelievable aggression by China. If you look at the balloon that flew over the United States, the Chinese police stations, the aggressiveness against our uh, both planes and ships and international water. The White House is looking for a diplomatic fix to the worsening relations sending a senior State Department official on a rare visit to Beijing. Biden administration officials should stop chasing after their Chinese communist counterparts like love-struck teenagers. It's embarrassing and it's pathetic. In fact, it projects weakness to China. National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan says the Biden administration will responsibly manage its relationship with China, and at some point, Joe Biden will meet again with China's President Xi. Dale Hurd, CBN News. Here's a quick look at some of the other big stories we're following for you in CBN News. No survivors have been found after the crash of an unresponsive plane. It flew over the nation's capital Sunday afternoon. The plane caused the military to scramble a fighter jet, which caused a loud sonic boom heard across the capital region. The plane crashed in a rural part of the Shenandoah Valley. The pilot had reportedly passed out. 
And in India, the death toll now stands at at least 275, with hundreds injured after three trains crashed Friday in India. It is one of the worst trail disasters in the country's history. Indian investigators believe the crash was caused by an error in the electronic signaling system. Black market cannabis tainted with toxins. Drug cartels are shipping migrants to Northern California, where they're forced to work on illegal marijuana farms. These farms are also threatening California's water supply, and there are other dangers from the cartels as well. Chuck Hulton reports on the far-reaching repercussions of the crisis on our southern border. The impact of migrants pouring across the U.S. southern border is reaching here in Humboldt County, California, helping fuel a rise in illicit cannabis operations staffed by undocumented workers. Instead of escaping poverty and oppression, many migrants often find a rude awakening here in America. So modern day slavery is happening here. Labor trafficking is, is a major deal here when it comes to marijuana. Uh, like I said, it's, it's something to where, you know, you have, this is still very much organized crime. And we have organized crime and syndicates from all over the world that are here in California that are invested in growing marijuana illegally and, and funneling through the markets, again, throughout America and throughout the world. And so they're bringing in their own labor and they're forcing them here to work against their will. And so Sometimes they're, they're sold into sex slavery. Sometimes they're just used for labor. And we even had uh, a case here about 10 years ago where we had two people from Guatemala that were shot. It's not just that these illegal marijuana grows here in California are a driver of 70% of all of the illegal marijuana consumed in the United States. It's also not just a driver of a whole lot of illegal migration to work those grows. But one of the biggest problems caused by these illegal grows is right here, what you see behind me. The very precious resource of clean, clear, drinkable water here in California as they come off a 100-year drought. These plants take a lot of water, and they take a lot of this drinking water off the table for the consumers here in the Golden State. This stuff is obviously, we have a regulated market now in California under Prop 64, many states have regulated cannabis, but this is the illegal stuff that will never be allowed. It's on public and private land, it's not grown with permits, it's not organic, it has deadly pesticides on it. Some of them, brother, that are so deadly, they were banned by the EPA in America 20 years ago. In addition to the health threat posed by pesticides, the men running these secret farms are often armed and aggressive. They're armed. Mm -hmm. They don't you know, want to give up in many times. There's a lot of poisons that we run across and exposure could be deadly. And actually on the private lands, it's even more dangerous because it's so much concentrated. The origin of these hidden operations traces back to a familiar evil south of the border. And we got to remember that isn't only a cannabis problem that these cartels are part of. Uh, these cartels are also the same groups. If they're growing black market cannabis that's tainted with these toxics, they're also trafficking, you know, dirty fentanyl pills that are killing hundreds of thousands of Americans. Dealing with these issues daily, Sheriff Hansel believes he's in the right place. We see in Humboldt County and in California good versus evil. We see the evil of child abuse, of drugs, of sex trafficking. We see people's worst days every single day. And we have a very difficult time sometimes dealing with that and coping with that. And I, I believe if you didn't have a Christ-centered life, you can't rationalize that. God has put me here, and this is my mission, the Sheriff's Office, the people of Humboldt County, and when God tells me that it's time to go, I'll go. From Northern California, I'm Chuck Holton for CBN News. Coming up, we're taking you to Israel where we're going to show you how a landmark from biblical times, the Tower of David, is being restored and refreshed by modern technology. We'll have the story for you when we come back. Your news channel. Your shows. The stories you care about. Anytime you want. Anywhere you want. Download the CBN News app today. One of Jerusalem's ancient landmarks is being restored by a deep dive into the world of technology. Now visitors can not only see the renovated Tower of David Museum, but also touch it and follow its history. CBN Middle East correspondent Julie Stahl takes us there. 
The Tower of David Museum takes visitors through 3,600 years of the ancient city's history. Museum director Elat Lieber says the age of the infrastructure meant a major upgrade was planned for a decade and renovations have gone on for three years at a cost of $50 million. We wanted to engage the visitors, especially the young generation, with the story by adding technology, interactive media, and of course the real objects that came back home to the citadel. Jerusalem has a secret. Else, how we can explain what Jerusalem is? How it became so sacred to so many people the world over? And while the rule in most museums is please don't touch, this newly renovated version shares a different message, please touch. We want them to touch, to engage and be intrigued about what they're doing in the museum. Curator Tal Kobo says the exhibits now tell a thematic story. The first gallery is talking about the scope of time, how long and all the cultures and empires that ruled the city. There are 12 interactive screens chronicling the history of Jerusalem, and they're meant to be touched. Here we have the British Mandate period from 1917 to 1948. We can see it in English, have a map of the city, see what world events were happening at the time, and the timeline of Jerusalem. Creative director Yoav Cohen says his team took on the challenge of telling these stories in a creative, experiential, and user-friendly way. We're making movies, we're making interactive, we're making computer games. It is a very thin line between telling the interesting story and uh, to be an engagement and uh, to be precise on the other side and correct with history. The second, third, and fourth galleries show how Jerusalem became sacred to Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. Each consists of a model with its own iconic building, such as the second Jewish temple, although it was gone by the end of the first century. Mostly Jewish people did not live in Jerusalem, but the memory of Jerusalem still existed. And those objects that carries the Manoah symbolizes the connection to Jerusalem. This is the room of Christianity. In the center, there's this huge model of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Museum consultant on Christianity, Yiska Harani, says Jerusalem has been seen through a prism influenced by the Byzantine era of the Roman Empire for nearly 1,700 years. Byzantine Jerusalem lay the foundations for how people perceive Jerusalem in history. This is why, behind me, there is the beautiful replica made by a mosaic of the Madaba map. Found in a church in Jordan, that is the oldest known map of the Holy Land and Jerusalem. So this room is also titled Sacred Geography, because what it drew the Christians here was to see the sacred geography. Jesus came into a geography. And the Muslim gallery has a replica of the Dome of the Rock on the Temple Mount. This is an original mask that we are actually standing in. Someone asked me the question about touching the exhibition. Well, I think there is no replace to touching the walls. Part of the renovation included making the ancient fortress more accessible to those physically challenged. That included adding two elevators so all visitors could see the 10 galleries. They still, however, couldn't reach the observation deck. We came with the idea of using VR glasses or another product, um, 360 degrees footage that we took of the observation in order that everyone would be able to see our beautiful observation. Lieber calls it the gateway to Jerusalem. The Tower of David is, uh, of course, a very unique building the fortress of Jerusalem, the symbol of the city that represents the power, the beauty of Jerusalem for many ages. Julie Stahl, CBN News, the Tower of David Museum, Jerusalem. Still ahead, an important question for the GOP in the upcoming presidential election, how to be pro-life without turning off some swing voters. Contenders for the Republican presidential nomination speak out on this pivotal issue right after this.
It's called the ostrich strategy, when political candidates hide their heads in the sand on abortion after the Supreme Court sent it back to the states. That's how the behavior of some GOP presidential contenders is being described. They're ducking the life issue, knowing it might hurt them with some voters. CBN's chief political analyst, David Brody, explains the challenges of pro-life politics. Since the end of Roe, the abortion issue has become more complicated politically for the GOP. The lack of a cohesive message following the Supreme Court decision cost them some midterm races. Now, candidates must figure out how to be pro-life while also not turning off swing voters. Former White House Press Secretary Kayleigh McEnany tells CBN News that it's been an overall passive strategy. They never go on offense on this issue. They tend to hide from it, um, rather than giving an optimistic and loving view for how we as a party treat life and the heartbeat and the child. Um, but they always stay on their heels. They avoid the topic. And then when they do talk about it, they never go on offense and ask the left, where do you draw the line? That often leaves Republican politicians, especially those running for president, facing questions about where they stand on a federal abortion ban. Their answers vary. President Trump supported a 20-week ban while in the White House. Now, as a candidate, he plans to negotiate the best deal. Some people are at six weeks. Some people are at three where did, weeks, two President weeks. Trump? Uh, President Trump is going to make a determination what he thinks is great for the country and what's fair for the country. Recently, Trump suggested the six-week abortion ban in Florida, signed by presidential candidate Governor Ron DeSantis, may have been too harsh, leading to a quick response. I think that uh, as a Florida resident, you know, he didn't give an answer about uh, would you have signed the heartbeat bill? that Florida did, that had all the exceptions that people talk about, the legislature put it in. Uh, I signed the bill, I was proud to do it. He won't answer whether he would sign it or not. From a political perspective, the squabbling over bans ranges from how many weeks to staying away from that part of the issue. GOP presidential candidate Senator Tim Scott supports a 20-week ban. And recently, GOP presidential candidate Asa Hutchinson told CBN News, there's a reason the GOP should act at the federal level. I would like to see this resolved at the state level, but I know the Democrats, if they get control of Congress, they're going to have a national abortion standard that opens up the floodgates for abortion. Republicans, if we actually win control of both houses, we have an opportunity uh, to set a national standard on that. If Congress did act on that, and it protected life, and it had the appropriate exceptions in place, then I would sign that bill. On that subject, Republican presidential contender Nikki Haley is taking a wait-and-see attitude. While staunchly pro-life, she says when it comes to a federal ban, you need to be realistic. We've seen in Florida, Governor DeSantis support a six-week ban in Florida. That's in Florida. Asa Hutchinson's in. He seems to be okay with a 15-week ban. But you're reluctant to kind of go there now. Is that accurate to say you're reluctant right now to go there? Let's be honest with the American people. Let's be honest that no Republican can ban all abortions because we are not even close to 60 votes in the Senate. The We're 45. Mm -hmm. We haven't had 60 in over 100 years. No Democrat can ban all all these life laws that are happening in the states because they're not even close to 60 votes. So if we're going to talk about any legislation at the federal level, let's start with consensus. National pro-life groups point to a clear consensus, citing polls that show more than 7 in 10 Americans oppose abortion after 15 weeks. That includes 75 percent of women and 70 percent of independents. Marjorie Denensfelser, president of the Susan B. Anthony list, says the GOP needs to stop running away from the issue. What is then the Republican strategy going forward specifically? You say can't be the ostrich strategy. What is the 30-second Reader's Digest pitch here? I would be saying the 15-week minimum standard, yes, it isn't all that we want, but it is consensus in this country. And contra contrasted with your position, Democrat pro-abortion candidate, it is, uh, it is a winning issue every single time to contrast 15 weeks with unlimited abortion up into the end, paid for by taxpayers. That's what they ought to be saying. Dannenfelser says that includes pro-life congressmen who supported a federal abortion ban before the Roe reversal. Now they see it as a state's rights issue, and she says 
That's not nearly enough. What's your message to Republican senators and, and House GOP members as well? Sitting back and waiting means death to children, and it means women don't get the love and service that they actually need. So if you're a senator and you say this is a state's rights only position, then the position of the pro-life movement is we cannot support you. The nation will be watching how it all unfolds as we get closer to 2024. David Brody, CBN News, Washington. Coming up, see how you can take steps to improve your brain health, even if you're older. We're going to bring you that story when we come back. Stay with us. Download the CBN News app 24-7 News from a Christian perspective at home or on the road. One place for all of your news. Breaking news alerts. Set daily prayer goals and pray for news stories. Read the most important news and watch CBN News Channel Live. CBN News, because truth matters. Go to CBNNewsApp.com to get the app today. Some helpful news from the world of health about how exercise can improve brain health in older Americans. A study from the University of Maryland at College Park tested about 33 volunteers. They were all in their 70s and 80s, and some of them suffered from mild cognitive impairment. After the test, about half of the group began walking 30 minutes a week while the rest remained sedentary. After four months, they took the tests again, and those who exercised scored better, even those with cognitive impairment. Also, scans showed their brains actually changed. Connections were stronger with brain cells and networks showing more activity. Time now for your Monday motivation, and today I leave you with this thought in hopes of helping you to jumpstart your week. At the end of your rope is the start of God's reach, and you at your breakdown is also a moment of breakthrough. You may be tired, you may be weary, but don't quit. Do not throw in the towel. This may be the time to be still and watch God move. Well, that will do it for this edition of CBN News. Watch and remind you, you can always find more of our news programs on the CBN News channel. You can find them there at any time as well as online, cbnnews.com. Let us know what you think about the stories you've seen here today. You can email us at the address right there on your screen, newswatch at cbn.com. And of course, you can always reach out and touch us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We certainly would love to hear from you. Make this a marvelous Monday and join us right back here, same time tomorrow. Goodbye and God bless.